Third Degree, the podcast is brought to you by Soccer 90. North Texas SC first kick sale is here. 30% off all North Texas soccer club stuff through Friday the 23rd. And all other merchandise at Soccer90.com is 25% off for Third Degree listeners. Just use the promo code Third Degree. Well, hello there, FC Dallas Curious fan. Welcome to another edition of Third Degree, the podcast. Hi, my name is Peter, and I'm here again with my two buddies. First off, Dan Crook. Hello, Dan. Hey, Peter. I'm calling in from uh, Tennessee, where I'm currently trying to track down the uh, distillery for Old Major Bacon Flavored Bourbon. (laughs) Couldn't get enough of that stuff, could you, Danny? Uh and of course, uh, your hero, my hero, editor, founder of Third Degree, the uh, the dot net, the good Buzz Carrick, come and Buzz. Hi, Peter. Uh, unfortunately, not calling in from practice today, just from my sofa because I sprained my ankle and it hurts. Oh so, no! Yeah, I'm again. Did you sprain sprain your ankle after you got super drunk on <laughs> alcohol last week? No, I did it a couple weeks ago, um, working on my house, and then. It sort of got worse and worse and worse last week, including when I went out and stood on it for a couple hours at practice. It really made it inflame up. So now I got a big old boot on. <laughs> Took one for the team, Peter, and now it hurts. So now it hurts. Oh. Yeah. That means you didn't go to practice today, doesn't it? No, I did I didn't. Hopefully I'll be back next week. I just I couldn't go out there and stand on it for a couple hours without I mean, even in the boot, you know, you're supposed to keep it elevated and it's a bummer. But we still should, got some information. Should. You should call one of the original uh, fans, Charlie, and ask her if you could borrow her wheelchair. Yeah, I, well, she probably needs it. <laughs> well, maybe she'd let you borrow it just for practice. Or yeah, something. yeah, yeah. It's a wheel out. She's there. sweet and kind that way. She's very generous. She is. Uh, okay, so what we do have to talk about is the first game of the season. The Colorado Rapids in town, bringing back Kellen Acosta and. Uh, uh, Michael Barrios in a very funny bit stepping in for the lineup shot at the beginning. I don't know if that was something they asked him to do or if he stepped in and just did it as a joke. Either way, it was pretty great to see. But the game wasn't all that entertaining, and it ended up at the worst possible result, Donuts 0-0. Zero, zero. Uh, what's your big takeaway from that scintillating season opener, Buzzard? Well, first, I loved the picture, actually, because it took him a while to get Michael's attention. They were waving at him, yelling at him, and getting him to come over. Oh, you know? okay. So, so they that, asked him to come over. Yeah, That's sweet. Yeah. Okay. They're, I thought maybe I'm, he had been pulled a funny bit and stepped in on his own accord. No, no, no. They definitely had to be like, come on, come on, come on, and waved him over. I, you know, I, I really like that. I mean, I, listen, I totally get the idea of, like, he's not on the team anymore. Or if you're Colorado, you're like, you're on our team now. I, I get it, I guess. But, you know, when you play for one team so long and become, like, a big – hero there for a period of time and the fans still love you. I mean, the Almatador gave him a thing, a scarf, I think it was. And, you know, I, I think there's some respect for him there. You know, Kellen Acosta, for example, has been gone long enough that nobody here really knows him. So he didn't get the wave over, but Barrios is still really tight buddies with all these guys and got traded like a month and a half ago. So I'm totally cool with the picture. I thought it was a lot of fun. So the big takeaway for me is, the big picture lineup being the three four three like we predicted, but still that's a little bit unusual. Um, relatively solid defense, and uh, the other takeaway is the disconnect in the offense, which is not yet up to par. So that's the big takeaway. Uh, Dan, did you have any particular highlights or lowlights you want to start off the pod with? I mean, you know, for me it was uh, it was a very it, it was a very even game. Two teams. Uh, we finished what, fifth and sixth last year. Looking to uh, be in that mix for the, let's hope, fourth place becomes available. Um, scraps. And then it's just a typical early season game. Like Buzz said, there was a lot of disconnect going forward, out of the wing back positions particularly. You know, um, it's just uh, a lot of little things that need improving. And... You know, hopefully that should uh, that should happen with San Jose reeling off the back of that loss to Houston. Yeah, I, I was. Uh, I I don't know if you guys think it would be unfair for me to say that the Dallas lucked out that Kellen ended up having to emergency 
play left back for Colorado because I just had a sense based on how the game actually went that if Kellen had been in the middle of the field, that would have been a very different result. Oh, no, I totally agree with you. Yeah, that's the best Kellen has looked in, I mean, since he got traded. You know, it's and it's not just like, oh, was his touch good or was he? It was he was how active, number one, how fit he was, how much mm-hmm. ground he covered, how active he was, how engaged he was. You know, if that player is in midfield, that's a handful to handle. Dallas was lucky, as you say, that Vimes was hurt or questionable or whatever and wasn't available. And then they reacted to O'Brien's pace by putting Acosta over there. Kellen being one of the faster players in their team, he can handle him better than almost anybody else can. That would have been a lot for Dallas to deal with if he had been in the middle. You know, Colorado spent most of the game playing. I mean, ostensibly, they're on a 4-2-3-1, I think. But the way they lined it up, it looked like a 4-4-2 most of the time because they're they're defending in sort of a mid-ish block in the first half when Dallas had some good chances. Then they adjusted and played it a little deeper, and then Dallas didn't have a lot of luck after that. Um, but, yeah, Kel- that was Kellen's best game that I've witnessed since he got traded. All right, I'm just going to say it. I hate this 3-4-3 or 3-4-2-1, whatever you want to call it. I, I don't get it. I don't understand what Lucci's trying to do with the ball. I think uh, Acosta and uh, Ricarte, there were so many really weird times in the game where I felt like the team was overly defensive. There were moments where in the defensive half of the field, there was Mar Mauer, three center backs and and uh, uh, Brian Acosta and then everybody else in the Colorado's half of the field. And I just couldn't for the life of me figure out what the plan was or why they're trying to play this formation or what advantage Lucci thinks he gets out of this. Well, it comes down to the center back, um, you know, having that extra guy back there aggressively moving towards the midfield rather than having a, a, a center mid like a like a surreal chasing um i agree with you that i don't particularly like it the way dallas does it because uh one of the things that was a problem all game is because their wings are staying high like wings should be and normally they're on top of their wing backs and there's no space and it comp- and it it just ruins that whole thing there's at least what I think of as a 3-4-3, you get what you had described, which is the 3-4-2-1. Is those wings want to come inside and almost play underneath the striker, and they didn't do that. So like when they mm-hmm. sit out there on top, it's like, where are the wingbacks going to go? You're like, you've eliminated half of the exciting attacking play of the wingbacks. Now, Lucia on the call today admitted that the wingbacks need to be more aggressive and get forward more, and I wanted to tell him, well, how can they do that when there's a wing in the way? You know, So for me, it, you don't want to have it be a – Real three five two, or have that inverted what for up front or whatever, but it has to get narrow. And until they get that, I think you're gonna. That's one of the reasons why they have this disconnect. You know, I totally get it why Luigi's doing it because like Colorado basically play with a two striker system, even though on paper it's not really that way. The way they execute it because they sit so deep, it ends up being that way. It'll be really interesting to see when we talk later what we think is going to happen against San Jose because they for sure play a regular four three two one with a single high striker. I don't know if you noticed uh, saying about they need to play narrower and, and the kind of log jam with the wingers, but Ryan Hollins had kept, I don't know if it was a case of trying to seek out the ball, but he kept running into like the eight spot and he was like mm-hmm. incredibly static in it. So anytime anything came down the right, it was like a massive to do just to really cover his defensive responsibilities. Well, that's, he has that instinct to play outside in, which from when, when he's a left back on the other side. And so he's still doing that because there is still a wide wing ahead of him. So, I mean, we, well, this, I don't know This how wasn't he, even with the ball. It was just, it yeah. was just out of, uh, just in a, an open phase of play. He would just kind of run in and fill that space as if really without need. Well, I mean, you know, Dallas had kind of abandoned the midfield at that point. And yeah. Colorado wasn't really pushing up. It just, it was kind of like, uh, you know, when you watch, it was kind of like watching uh, like a young age youth soccer where where a kid either just instinctively guns it after the ball or just kind of guns it to the most open space no matter how terrible it is and goes give me the ball give me the ball well that's a particularly weird reaction because more of Colorado's play if I remember correctly came down the left at least that's what I remember happening you know maybe to exploit that space and it certainly is a problem when uh, you know, Obreon is not yet doing the full like check back that he should be doing. You know, yeah. there's definitely some issues with this formation. I'm with you, Peter. I don't like it at all, but um, you know, I think we're going to see it some more. 
Well, I think the thing that I find most puzzling about it, and and again, and I think Steve Davis, the great Steve Davis, by the way, uh, continues to try to remind everybody and dispel this notion that uh, Andre, uh, Andreas Ricarte is somehow a Mauro Diaz clone or replacement, and he's not. I mean, Buzz, even you, from the very first days we even heard about the guy, tried to make everybody understand he's not a an attacking midfielder in that sense. He's a deep-lying creative player. Yeah. And uh, the problem I really saw a lot in the game was these weird periods of time where he and uh, Acosta were sitting super deep, and there was this weird hole where you would typically find either somebody coming back from uh, a, an attacking position or just, you know, right there in the middle of the field in this really critical space, there was nobody for Dallas. And maybe that's why Ryan was running into that space all the time because, hell, if nobody else is going to do it, maybe he, he thinks he needs to do it. Yeah, certainly. And that's the space that in a three five two that the number 10 takes up that space. We've all seen that yeah. formation a million times. And that's why we say when you play the three four three version of it, which is with a single high nine, those wingers shouldn't be wingers. They should be cut inside, filling into that space so you're not getting overloaded in midfield and you're creating the gap for the wingbacks to run into. So 100% correct. There's a hole in the Dallas formation. Dallas ends up with two central mids instead of what should be three or even four from time to time. And so they get overloaded in the central midfield and it end up with a play trying to go wide and yet not functioning because the wide play is not working as it should either. So it's there's definitely a lot of miss i mean not, not even disconnects just like wrong functionality in the way the team's doing it in the front final third of the field yeah i i dan maybe you have a an answer to this i can't quite cotton in my head if it's a bad sign that the team looks so disjointed at this point or if it's actually a good sign considering they were playing a colorado team that is largely the exact same team they had last year has a lot of consistency and a lot of people buzz included uh, has them as kind of a, a dark horse in terms of being super competitive this year, and you held them uh, goalless. I don't know which way to look at it. I mean, uh, definitely uh, towards the positives. It was their second game um, total playing that formation. It was, um, you know, nine, uh, sorry, 10 changes from opening day last year. Only Matt Hedges in the same position. And even that was, you know, really a, a more central position. Um, and again, like you mentioned, you've got a, a very consistent Colorado side, one that you know looked good. Michael Barrios definitely had that intensity of coming back to make someone uh, regret trading him, and I think Kellen really showed that as well. So, mm. you know, I mean, it, it, it's a little frustrating because Dallas definitely had the better ch- the the better quality chances, but the the quantity was definitely with Colorado, which at home you definitely don't want. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Mr. Frank O'Hara here for a couple of minutes. Mm. Uh, I, you know, I, I, it was interesting. I thought he tried really hard and he worked really hard. I, the one of the comment I have is, from the game was, is that Lucci has been unable to get this team to press well as a team and i thought part of the reason why haro so Haro so clearly gassed out at the 60 minute mark is because he had expended so much energy trying to press high early in the game uh fruitlessly because the guys that are supposed to be doing it with him weren't doing it very well i mean colorado was easily passing bypassing dallas's press with and in fact i don't even think dallas even forced a single turnover uh, uh, using the high press the entire game, to the best of my knowledge, um, and and I and I just wondered if maybe Lucci needs to back off on that if he's ever going to get a, a a good eighty ninety minutes out of Hara. Well, the upside of that is that well, basically the last couple of games Hara actually has been engaged completely. <laughs> So I'd be afraid if you told him to quit pressing that you might lose that engagement and he would get static again. I know what you mean. Like definitely like one of the stats we, I looked at last year was that Dallas doesn't compared to a lot of teams that Dallas actually doesn't press very much in the final third. They tend to wait and press deeper down the field. They do press just not up high. One of the reasons why Lucci rebuilt the offense is because he didn't get the press he was wanting. Right. So the, like anything else, the press is a work in progress. I, I'm with you that right now that, even with her fully engaged, I'm not seeing more than I'm seeing from Ricardo Pepe. And I always come back to the idea, if they're going to be the same, play the one that's 19. You know, Har is going to have to do more than 
play the same as Pepe for me. But then again, I'm not the coach. So, you know, I think we're going to be seeing Hara for the foreseeable future, at least until Jesus is healthy again. And it's going to be hard to really complain as long as he stays engaged and keeps putting in the effort that he put in. Because I don't, I didn't have him down as a bad game because he worked so damn hard. You know, that's a lot of times that's all we really ask for. I mean, granted, as good as much as he's getting paid, we should be seeing a lot more. But I don't know that that's something that Lucci can can change, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, then let's look uh, on the debut of a couple of guys or three guys on the team. And before we get to the attacking players, I want to go back to the back line, which is part of the reason why I'm so confused by Lucci's use of the three four three and inserting Brisson in there is that I kind of felt the whole point to um, the reason why everybody should have been excited about the addition of Martinez is do you really feel like they need a third center back when they've got Matt Hedges and this guy, two guys that are clearly great center backs, great defenders, and both clearly can pass the ball? Well, I think some of that isn't just about the th- extra center back. I think some of it is about not believing that Edwin is ready yet, that Edwin has sold them that he can single six it yet. Mm-hmm. You know, th- th- there's a third option that I, I want to bring up later, but um, – Basically, that's that's based on the last couple of games of preseason and this game now. That's the only this decision that right now is up for grabs. It's Edwin versus Brisson, and that changes the lineup. You know, on the upside, Brisson actually had a really good game statistically speaking, and so did Brian Acosta statistically speaking. So, you know, you can look at the defensive work and the way they kept that game pretty tight. Now it is a home game; you're supposed to do that. So those are all positives. You know, it's going to be hard for Lucci, I think, to who is more conservative defensively. It's going to be hard for him to say, yeah, let's go back to Edwin when you had a basically pretty good game. And really that extra center back is just a question. Lucci even mentioned it today on the call. Having that extra player there that can attack anything coming out of the midfield and help shut it down. Because let's be honest, Dallas midfielders sometimes have trouble tracking people. That happens fairly frequently with the cost <laughs> for sure, you know, and it, it didn't happen last game because he wasn't asked to do it. So, you know, it may be that this is a band aid in a lot of ways to the way he really wants to get towards maybe the middle part of the season. If, and when, cause we all know his four, three, three is his preferred preference, Lucia's preference. So but we'll have to see how long this band aid stays in place. Is it though? I think it is for sure. The four, you mean it's the four, three, three, his, Formation of preference. Choice. Well, is it yeah. currently? I mean, I knew I, I oh. know it was at one time, but I wonder if it is anymore. Like, yeah, because we we saw it. I mean, we didn't see it, but for the reports I got of the formation, it was okay. the it was that four three three most of the spring, and then right towards the very end, they did it once, and then they did it opening day. So okay, so this is going to take me back to a question we asked a couple weeks ago. Why the hell did they sell Santos? Well. Not to revisit again, but a combination of age and contract and opportunity and creating an open international spot. And Edwin had been good enough that you think that he can get it eventually. Yet Lucci's just conservative and isn't ready to do it 100%. Hmm. I mean, it may be possible that Lucci didn't have anything to do with selling Thiago Santos. Way, well, more than way- likely, he has to go home. And more than likely, Andres Zanata did it. You know, pretty much without talking to Lucci, I would imagine. I'm not sure he talked to him, but there's no way they did it without talking to Lucci. Really? You think? I mean, I mean, I think they talked to him, but I don't know. But I mean, no. What I'm saying is, do you think you know Lucci gets a phone call one morning and says, "Hey, come to the office. We got to talk to you. We've sold Santos, or we're gonna, unless you tell me right now, 100 percent no." Like you know, I'm sure that it's a long going, ongoing conversation. I'm sure there was conversations like, you know, if we needed to dump some salary and get a national spot, could you? Which guy could you handle getting rid of? And mm-hmm. that was maybe the guy that was, but I I still think that there probably was a I'd like to go back home factor. There was here. there was a lot of talk from the club about people being so happy for the opportunity that he and his family have. So yeah, I mean it probably is player led that he's had this opportunity to go to to Gremio and you know probably take a big bump in pay, and, you know, and go home more than right. anything. Um, okay, then the other two new guys, Mr. Vargas and Mr. O'Brien, uh, lots of effort, lots of hustle, 
not a ton of production, and it was interesting to see these guys for the first time against you know legit MLS starters in a real game versus what we've uh, been treated to so far. Yeah, the most interesting thing for me is how many touches Vargas had compared to the rest. It's pretty clear just through the, the way the play built that the rest of the team has already decided that he's the fulcrum for the front because he had, uh, off the top of my head, I think it was like 10 more touches than O'Brien and then another six or seven more than Hara did. you know, And that is with Johnny Nelson hardly ever getting any of the ball on his side. So people were bypassing Nelson to get to Vargas and bypassing Hara and Brian to get to Vargas. So that's fascinating from a team perspective already, you know, that they recognize that what he's doing and then he essentially has become the front six fulcrum. That's fascinating. Uh, Dan, what are your highlight takes on the two new attacking players? Uh, you know, a lot of what we saw in those last couple of preseason games, I like, um, I know Lucci likes uh, a winger that can get to the end line and drill a cross in. You know, they are definitely two guys that can converge in the center. I almost wish that Maxi Aruti was still around just <laughs> as a guy on that late run that they could lay off to who can, you know, actually run onto a ball and shoot it. Uh, you know, it's a degree of irony. You get the striker who's in the box finally, and then you get the wingers afterwards that, that don't necessarily suit that. Uh, you know, we've seen quite a few times Al Hara seems to almost get in their way when they're attacking the box. Hmm. So, Buzz, overall, uh, based on what you saw on Saturday, uh, are you disheartened by the situation? Do you feel like it's just a, a massive work in progress and you feel like the, the bits and pieces are there for something to get significantly better and more competitive in terms of creating opportunities and finishing them? No, I th- I'm pretty positive about it, actually, um, because – as always happens at the beginning of this season, uh, team defense comes together faster than team offense does. As an individual basis, the opposite is different. Uh, attacking as an individual is instinctive, and attacking as a, and defending as an individual has to be learned. But as a team concept, team defending almost always comes out of the gate really strong. At least it does for sure under Lucci. Um, so this continues a trend where the, the this defense last year was good. The defense like it hasn't missed a step. It's good again. You know, uh, the things that are going on in the front, the, the the problems for me, the worrisome for me are the way the wingbacks aren't working. And Nelson had a really good game when he got the ball. He just needs a lot, lot more of the ball. I mean, I think Ryan had like three times, not three times, maybe twice the touches that Nelson had. It was mm-hmm. a lot more. And then and then Ryan on his side wasn't connecting with Obreon because he, he was going all back into the middle again. So there's definitely between the wingbacks and the, the fact they got overloaded in midfield and the fact that the front line is not where it was considering all that, it still looked pretty decent. The best part was of the, I think if I'm off the top of my head, it's 11 shots they had at home. That's not enough. All right. We've talked about that. Not enough chance creation, not enough getting together, but all but two of the shots came in the box and there were a couple of blocks. And so it was well over 50% of them too were on target. So that's good shot selection. And that's pretty good on target efficiency. So both of those things are positive. There's just work to be done, particularly in this formation with the way the front's going to work. Maybe that's a problem we've had for quite a while in Arlucci. We'll see, you know, and I think that the normal four, three, three will be better with the third midfielder in there. I think that'll help a lot. Um, when we see that, well, that's a good question. So hmm. I'm not worried when the first game is zero, zero, that's okay. You know, if, if, if we struggle to score or they struggle to score over the next three or four games, you know, then we're going to start to get really concerned. They were a big part of the lack of the productivity, and I'm not sure if uh, some of this is just uh, getting used to a new system, but we really haven't talked about Ricarte and Acosta in any great detail yet. Uh, considering that they are getting the starts over homegrowns, and again, this was a starting 11 that didn't have a homegrown in it, um, you know, any particular thoughts or concerns or worries about those two guys? Uh, not for me. I mean, maybe Dan has some. I actually thought Acosta was really good. Uh, he was quiet, but he didn't have any of the fired shots over the top. He didn't break a Toyota truck window? He didn't break a Toyota truck window. He didn't lose <laughs> any marks in transition. And if you look at his pure numbers, he was 85% passing. 
He was two for two on dribbles. He had four progressive possessions, which is where you take it and get forward into space. Mm -hmm. Two key passes, right? Three tackles. He had 17 defensive pressures. And he had he was 91% on his own de- receptions of passes, which he's only fumbled like one, and eight recoveries. So when you include no shots into the stands and no failed trackings, for Brian Acosta, that's a really good day. Now, is it DP good? I, I don't know. But if you forget about a salary for a minute, that's a pretty solid performance, you know. I mean, I would like to see more out of him based on how much he gets paid. And I would have liked to have seen more from uh, Ricarte in the sense of getting an actual assist. But I think Ricarte had the highest X assist on the day, which is basically like where he puts a guy in a spot for an assist mm-hmm. and then they blow it, you know, so he's doing the right things. It's just, <laughs> you know, it's a work in progress. Those guys being overloaded in midfield, they had a lot of hard work to do. And, you know, that's part yeah, of it. Yeah, I, I find the more that I see him play, the more that I find Ricarte to be a really mysterious uh, component to this team because he is such a deep-lying playmaker uh, it almost feels like there's he's forced to play to try to create magic with everything being something more than 20 or 30 yards uh one way or the other i i i it really feels like there's a third missing component in the midfield to really get the most out of that guy um and, and that's why i find the formation as they're using yeah. it now to be so worrisome well again you know, if those wings aren't coming in underneath where like a 10 would be in a three, five, two, yeah. you know, I mean, one of the reasons why we've talked about, I talked about a year, oh, well, not a year ago, it was maybe eight months ago now, like maybe that would be a really great formation was one, it would put Jesus as a off striker and number two, it would get you a pure creative 10 in there, like a Paxton, for example, or whoever else to play in that hole and fill some of those roles. So, um, it's, it's, it's. I'm of two minds. I'm with you, Peter. I, I really, really like the guy as a player, but something is not working correctly. And Dan, maybe, maybe I don't know what you think. Maybe it's just an extra guy missing in midfield. Maybe it'll be better when it's back to four three three. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, I think it looked better as a four three three. I mean, there's only so much you can do with Brisson trying to play up uh, when in possession. Um, yeah, they almost seem to split a little bit rather than the. Uh, Ricarte stepping up ahead as as kind of more of that free eight. So I don't know if it was more focusing on the defensive responsibilities or the fact that Jack Price was uh, trying to kill somebody in Ooh. midfield, and uh, Ricarte <laughs> definitely got the brunt of that a few times. But, um, yeah, yeah. Mr. Price got away with that one too many times. Yeah, without a day. six, without a six in there, those guys probably felt like they had more defensive responsibility to stay home. Dan, I'm sure that's an influence. Yeah, I, I just, uh, I mean, it's it's funny because, you know, we said, you know, they were quietly good, uh, both uh, Ricarte and, and Acosta. They, they were the two that had the bulk of the key passes. Um, just, yeah, you, you kind of want them to be a little bit more, uh, particularly a Ricarte, you want him to be a little bit flashier in that position, maybe catch some more attention. But, uh, yeah, yeah. I guess there's not really much uh, much else to say. And just just hopefully it's a a game one new formation kind of deal. Yeah, it's e- it's easy to be uh, to get overly concerned, but it is only the first game. I mean, you know, it's. I think Dan, you were the one that pointed out this is the first time that Dallas hasn't scored in a home opener, season opener in quite some time. I think it went since back to 2002. 2002. And only the second goalless draw in team history. The first, obviously, being the very first game. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, Now, the big highlight, obviously, and uh, relieving delight was to see one Paxton Pomacall come on to the field and actually leave the field in what appeared to be (laughs) relatively good shape. But, Buzz, I think uh, I, I think I caught you online saying, hey, I think everybody can now see what I'm talking about when I'm saying there's no way that dude is 100 percent. I mean, do you guys agree with me that that's the case? I have him at about 90. His touch was rough. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I there's a whole conversation we haven't had about Lucci's uh, use of substitutions in this game, and I still yeah. think he waited way too long. And I and and Paxton being so new to coming back and playing, I, I I have a hard time judging it. Like I can't tell if 
the the what I noticed that seemed to be not right with him was the function of him just trying to find the game, and he only had a few minutes to do that, or if there's actually a larger kind of like form issue in place, if that makes any sense. Yeah, the th- the things that were noticeable for me when when I say ninety percent is that I, I feel like there's just a tiny bit of like reach hesitation, like he really won't lunge out for something. And there's maybe just a tiniest bit of explosion on his burst missing, which are both, you know, very final stage of like complete confidence that I can really go, you know, when you have something in this kind of area, it is a core thing. So, I mean, he admitted today on the conference call, he was on, he said, he's not, he knows he's not 90 minutes fit. Lucci says something about, he's still trying to regain his health completely. So they, they know they're just trying to work him back in. Uh, the one thing I did enjoy was I asked on the call today as I asked Paxton about his upper body mm-hmm. mass, the weight, like not weight. I said the muscle that he's put on. Did you on. call him fatty, fatty no. two by four? No, I said, <laughs> I said, Paxton, I've not seen you in eight months. I, it was noticeable how much upper body muscle you've added. And he said that uh, I asked him if it was intentional because of the fact that you're banging in the midfield. You want to hold guys off. And he said it was a little bit, but it was actually kind of a byproduct of not being able to run. He wanted to stay fit, so he was working out a lot. And that he actually, in overall weight, he said he's lost weight because he dropped body fat in his core and added muscle weight, you know, which is a positive. I'm, I didn't joke about his fat cheeks or anything, but, you know, <laughs> I'm sure he's heard that, that we made fun of him for that. But so you, know, you was, wait, hold on, yeah. hold on, wait a second. You made fun of him for it. I made fun. We, I, I was trying to lump you guys in. I made fun. <laughs> no, Listen, I'm not the only one that said that. that. So Buzz like isn't that. telling the entire story here. Oh, what he no, actually no, started no. with was, uh, you know, since we're on the Zoom call and the cameras are, are on, he started with Paxton. I went out to training last week for the first time in a year <laughs> with this giant Cheshire gri- Cheshire cat-like grin. <laughs> it was magical. It was nice. It was nice. Uh, well. But anyway, Paxton said the, uh, the part of the story I wanted to tell was that he said that it, it was some of it was a byproduct of the fact that he couldn't run for a long time. So he was trying to keep fit by doing a lot of weight work. And he said, but he recognized the fact that it really helped him in midfield holding guys off. So that's uh, that's super positive because that's the thing that he's needed is that upper mm-hmm. body, you know, muscle to, to bull guys, you know. So I think overall, I love the direction he's heading physically. It's just he's just not there yet. Hmm. Okay. Uh, any other particular notes from that game that you guys want to get into or dig up or so, uh, One thing you, you'd mentioned the substitutions. Um, I, uh, I had a chance to ask Lucci about that after the game because I saw a lot of, you know, there were a lot of fans complaining why only two or five. And, uh, you know, it was kind of the same answer as always about, you know, I didn't want to destroy the balance and that, which, you know, I, I get like, you know, you've got uh, maybe you don't feel like you have the options on the bench uh, to to really make the change in the game. But one thing that kind of bugged me was as soon as Colorado dropped back into that low block and the wingers were just smashing balls over the top to Hara, who okay, yeah, he can get ahead to it, but he can't run onto a ball. That's when Pepe comes on, not twenty minutes after that. Yeah, he made Pepe stand there for a good two ten minutes before he took him over to sub him in. Uh, I, the only thing I can think of that makes sense with that is the idea that he's trying to push hard towards 90 minute fitness. That's the only reason I can think of because nothing else makes any sense in terms of why the, he held him out. The only other thing that, that came to mind for me was uh, because there was him and uh, Colorado were going to make a change as well. And then Dallas got that series of corners and a lot of coaches have that mantra that you do not make a substitution on a corner because it ruins mm-hmm. all your marking and yeah, yeah, everything yeah, else. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I I was surprised. I just thought there were more opportunities to introduce some uh, players and 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 take. You know, it's a home game, right? You know, and Colorado clearly has uh, made a decision to kind of sit a little bit and throw some a little bit more danger in there. And I just I don't know. I was a little disappointed that Lucci didn't uh, use uh, use some more of the tools at his disposal. Although I guess now that I think about it, I'm not sure who he would have thrown in there. That's it. The question is, who would have made a difference in that scenario? Hey, Zeus. Who was well, injured? Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. That was why I said it. But of of who was on the bench, like you know, Sealy's probably not gonna. El Macar's no. probably. I don't think El Macar was even on the bench. But you know, you've you've got a uh, not a lot going on the bench right then. 
Tana, maybe. Yeah, I, I would have loved to have seen him take Brisson off, take a center back off, throw another midfielder on, really get going for it, at least in the last 10 minutes. I, I just... I really thought the, the, the subs he made and the lack of use of that was really passive. But, you know, maybe he knows something about his situation that we, we don't aren't privy to. And That's uh, kind of his coaching style, though. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, yeah. All right, so uh, San Jose up this weekend. And, um, you know, they, they appear to be a hot mess. And, uh, you know, and... And and obviously creates all sorts of problems for people because of the formation and the style of man marking that they play. Uh, any particular guess, Buzz, if Lucci's going to change anything for this trip on Saturday? Yeah, if I was only going on Lucci's tactics and mi- if this was midseason, then I would say for sure they would go back to the four two three one or the four three four three three. I should say because. Mm-hmm. Um, the extra center back is about having two strikers or lots of guys overloading out of midfield. And San Jose doesn't particularly do that. They, they play a straight four, two, three, one with a high striker. So that guy likes to work a lot, but he's not particularly like game breaker. We're like, I don't think anybody like Matt Hedges or Martinez couldn't handle him by themselves. And then your outside backs would be closer in to handle their typical sort of wing play. So if it was only that, then I would say it's going to be the four, three, three, but for some reason, over the last two years, I've become completely convinced that Lucci will not risk defensively kids early. He will not risk guys he thinks aren't ready. He's not 100% convinced they're not ready defensively. And so that means in order for them to go back 4-3-3, three, three, is, does he believe Edwin Cerillo is ready to run as a single six? And I'm going to say the answer right now is no. So to me... That means we're going to see three four three. Now the other one other option would be the old triple pivot, right? Would be a Tessman, Acosta, Ricarte, four yeah. three three midfield, the triple pivot. But doing that on the road against San Jose, who likes to man mark and is crazy intense, I'm not sure that's the place for that. So I'm going to guess three four three in lineup. And if I I hadn't gone to practice this week, I'm sorry guys, or I'd be able to tell you more specifically. But I'm guessing at this point. But based on what I believe Lucci thinks, or even subconsciously thinks, that he'll chicken out and not go with Cerio and stick with the three four three. Wow, chicken out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It takes. <laughs> you don't think it takes guts to play a kid, play a twenty year old holding six on the road? He definitely is very protective, and even. Um... <sighs> I noticed him saying it on the on the post game call um, after the first game, talking about the guys that have had national team call ups of trying to be extra protective of them, and they're not ready yet. And yeah, no, I I, I definitely see where you're coming from in that. Think about when when Brian Acosta was Brian Acosta, excuse me, Brian Reynolds was getting ready, and I and I was like, it's going to be Brian when ready to leave. So he's ready. Blah, blah, blah. And then Lucci changed the whole formation to put Ryan over there to give those games to Ryan instead of just go ahead and play him Brian. Or the year before when when Cannon was gone for like three or four games and they went with Brisson at right back. It's like, dude, Brian was ready the whole time. You could have played him the whole time. So this is similar to that. I would like to see, uh, I would love to see Tanner in the midfield though to uh, just kind of deal with, you know, how they have the, the, they have them one on one v one set up. Uh, I don't like calling it man marking because that kind of oversimplifies it. But you know they they'll have the. You're such a snob. No, it's not that. It's people just misidentify things. Um, and uh, they'll, they'll have uh, a centre midfielder will step into the into the uh, into the attacking half really when they they start that high press from the very front and you kind of need someone to deal with with that additional player because you know in Almeida's first games nobody figured out that that was that was the difference that was the spare man that someone stepping out of midfield so someone someone like Tessman who can body a guy who could keep up with just about anyone you know that that could be a real difference maker just to break down that that press from the very start 
Yeah. yeah, Altimeda brought in the the, the guy from um, Chivas. Is it, uh, Chifus? I think that's how you say his name. Espinoza. He's sort mm. of a playmaking ten kind of guy. Plays in the midfield, and that's one of his big tricks: is blow coming forward out of midfield. And that comes back as Dan was just talking about. And that comes back to is Cirillo chasing that guy because you're going to be you're going to they have a three man midfield with Jackson Yuval in there, and I can't remember who the other guy is. So maybe you want him in there banging or. And he ends up having to chase that guy forward all the time, or do you go with the three center backs and Brisson is charging forward to get that guy? So it just it comes down to again for me: is he going to go with the twenty-eight-year-old Brisson or the completely inexperienced twenty-year-old Edwin Surio? You remember the very beginning of his first season, he played a whole lot of kids early when he was missing guys. Remember Thomas played a lot and Edwin played a lot, and some of those guys didn't do so great in those moments. So I think ever since then, he's been really reluctant to do it. And, I, and so that's why I think it's 3-4-3. Three, three. So I'm going to bring up this next thing that happened this week because I think in some ways this is related to this. Uh, the news that FC Dallas had traded with Toronto for an international roster spot for what was it, a quarter of a million dollars in GAM, LMNOP money, whatever yeah. they're calling it, which Monopoly is a money. lot of – Huh? Monopoly money. Yeah, yeah, fake money, but it's yeah. it's a lot of fake monopoly money. And and I ever since that's happened, I've been thinking to myself, who is you know, what position is it if they're gonna sign an international player, whether it's a younger or an older player, and we can get into that next, is that what position is it I think they need to find? And I and as much as I want to see more Johnny Nelson in my FC Dallas, I'm not convinced that if Lucci thinks he's gonna play a three four three he needs a better option, either moving Ryan back to the left side and finding a right wing back, or leaving Ryan on the on the right, which I don't think he should do, and finding a somebody else that can play that left wing back position a little bit more naturally than Johnny can. Well, uh, the question is, do you want to wait long enough for someone like Munjoma or Tuomase to progress? Uh, I think the other answer to the left wing back, if, if you don't think Johnny can do it, because Johnny would just need some time or more passes of the ball to him. Well, the but, other, hold on a sec. But hold yeah. on before you move on to about what. Let's talk about Johnny's game against Colorado in particular. Yeah. I know we've talked about it a little bit. But, I, you know, there were moments that I thought he really surprised me with his ball skills. I, I thought he made some really nice moves to uh, advance the ball and, and progress the ball forward. But then again, I saw him, you know, donkey touch the ball a couple of times or make a bad, simple pass for five yards. I mean, it was a real, you know, a pro and con game for him. And I, But I would say for the moments that I was impressed with his attacking progression, it was pretty clear that he's just that's not necessarily his natural. Uh, he's not in his natural element playing that position. No, and he would need to play into it a lot. But for the record, he had one key pass and three dribbles. And three crosses, all of which were some of the highest numbers on the team. And, and only 45 touches, which was one of the lowest numbers on the team. So a lot of things about it were good. I agree with you that's not the natural progression. But what I was going to say was that the the person to fix that spot might actually be on the roster already. And you're going to hate this. But on the conference call today, when somebody <laughs> actually asked Paxton where he's going to play, that he was said, me. oh, was it you? I'm stealing your you, – Dan, take the story then. Go ahead. No, no. I just uh, want the credit for it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Peter. When Dan asked Paxton where he was going to play, Paxton said, well, you know, I came in as an eight the other day. I played a little wing earlier. No. But I'm also going to play wing back. No, 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 no. So Paxton says that he is a wing back some for Lucci. Paxton so, Hollingshead. Yeah. So if my, you're looking I, for an out, look, the kid can play some defense. You can't see it or I have a finger gun in my mouth I right know, now. you want to vomit, yeah. The kid can press. He can play tenacious defense. He's not a quality tactical defender. He, he can learn play that. tenacious D. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's a big fan of the... Uh, uh, gosh, too young to know tenacious Triumph, D. yeah. A tribute, that's the song. Um, so, nonetheless, Paxton brought it up today that he's... And the mix at wing back. So, you know, you can maybe that one's not the good solution for what are they going to do with another DP player? Uh, well, okay. So then let's move on to that, which is yeah. we're, uh, like, okay, what in the buzz you made yeah. the you made the interesting note on Twitter of the irony that the club most known for its homegrown production is a club that now has ten international roster spots on yeah. it. 
Do we have any idea what this is about? And do we have have we heard anything about who they may be using this slot for? No, we have no clue. I mean, the obvious ones to me are with Jesus out. Maybe you want a nine. You know, maybe you're not a hundred percent convinced that you have options at wing. If like if Vargas gets a call up, or even just like in terms of load management, you want an extra body there. <laughs> You know, obviously you brought up right back and left back. Those are both legitimate, you know, right now. You have a lot of... Holding mid, maybe? Hold, yeah, 100% Everywhere holding mid right center now. Back. Um, What'd I you mean, say, you Dan? Can, Everything but center back. Yeah, well, if you're going to stay in three-man center back, you actually are short center backs. Because mm-hmm. if you're going to stay with three starting, you need more yeah. than just Burgess. You need five. Sorry, Tafari <laughs> hanging around. You need an extra one for sure. But um, the one thing we have to... Exp- I think we need to explain this new... U22 initiative. It's I'm gonna try and simplify it as much as possible. So you guys, are you remember, gonna make me sleepy? No, I'm gonna try and do it really simple. You remember <laughs> that every team has three DPS, right? Right now, Dallas only has two. So the new U22 initiative effectively allows you to have more young DPS. You remember that young DPS are mm-hmm. the same as DPS, except that the money is less, but it has to be a really young player. Like Santiago Mascara was a young DP when he got here. And so was um, Fabian Castillo. So the new U 23 thing, a U 22 initiative, excuse me, allows you to have three more young DPS. And if you only have two DPS, then you get all three of the U 22s. If you add a third DP, if that DP is young, you still get three. If he's an old guy who pays a crap ton of money, then you don't get three. So all you need to know for Dallas's reasons is, is that they get to add three more players that qualify as basically young DPs if they want to. Now, we think we think that's probably already happened with Philippe coming from up from Brazil with his price tag almost certainly is one of these guys. Mm-hmm. The kid shown that they just added from uh, out of the Ajax system and then wherever he was on in between, probably. And then given that Vargas is coming in, was like leading his league and scoring at 21 or whatever, he probably is the third. So they might already have those spots locked up, you know, in terms of how that rule works. <laughs> I know this is a lot. Wait, no, no, but... no, no. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm snarkily laugh, laughing because yeah. I find it ridiculous that we don't know that those three guys are or are not young DPS. Yeah, they're not listed. There's only two DPS listed on the roster, and that's Acosta and Hara. And so there's for sure a full price DP spot available. It can be a, a senior DP or a young DP, whichever one you want it to be, as long as he doesn't get paid over. I think 1. it's like a million six. six. Then yeah. you can still get, use all these slots, which Dallas we think is used. So it has to be a typical Dallas style DP, which is these mid price DPs that they love, like Ziegler was and that kind of thing. So and it's worth pointing out that the the U twenty two initiative really for Dallas doesn't matter too much. It's it's salary cap. And it's yeah. reducing the cost to either two hundred thousand or one hundred and fifty thousand if they're under twenty one, and on their first contract with MLS, which is why, you know, Jesus and Paxton couldn't couldn't be moved off the senior roster amounts for that, even though they're still technically homegrown. You know, well, we're we're talking about guys who aren't earning that much more than really the cap hit they're going to get anyway. So it's not like, you know, someone bringing in on one point five million a year young designated player and and then say and then only get in charge the 200 grand for that yeah basically the the thing to understand is that this is a rule that people like the hunts and we actually heard it was the hunts that pushed for this because they want the hunts and, and fc dallas like to sign players i don't know how to describe this roster width rather than roster height they don't want 15 million dollar or five million dollar players they want 10 Six hundred thousand dollar players. They want to sign a bunch of guys in this range, and younger guys. They want younger, even their farm players. They want them to be young, like Paxton is, or like Vargas is. You know, it's also a nice uh, compromise. You know, obviously the the talk is increasing designated player spots and and eventually doing away with them and just kind of opening the cap up a little bit. So having the ability to say, hey, you've got more young guys that can earn over a million and a half a year. That's that's effectively free money you're throwing at it. 
Yeah, and also effectively forget about the superstar DP. Not that you ever thought that was going to happen anyway, but now you really can't do it because it'll ruin this U22 initiative that the Hunts wanted. So, mm -hmm. again, I still think the options are striker. If It depends on how much you like Hara. I mean, two DPs at one spot seems ridiculous in some ways. Wing is maybe a little bit lacking in depth because some of the young pieces are not really convincing, especially if you're going to sell Dante Celia like I think they will. Maybe I think the one that jumps out at you in terms of budget, having sold Tiago Santos is, and having Ed would not be as much as we like his progression this year. Lucci doesn't believe in him yet, it seems. So that might be the one spot where they could go out and, and get this mid priced Tiago Santos, Grezzo style DP and, and get a little real impact with it. So uh, now that they've made this move, is there a deadline looming in terms of a window that everybody should? you know, be on alert to, to for this move to happen if they're going to sign somebody? Well, the current window is open for quite a while. I mean, the MLS window is really funky because of all the COVIDness. It's actually right. open until like, oh, Danny, you remember June what it 1st. Is? Was it yeah. June? That's what I was, got, I was thinking it was June. Yeah, I mean, that's long, relatively speaking. That's a couple of weeks away. And then the other one turns around and it's not that further away. It's I think it kicks open again in July or something. So, Because the season started so late, the windows are all wacky. Um, I, I wouldn't, you know, it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how fast they move. So far, Andre Zanata's looked like by the time they, they do something like pull off a trade for the spot, it's because they need the spot right then. So I, I'm actually expecting something to happen by the end of the window in the next two weeks, other than Sean, actually. I mean, and Sean's one. arriving soon too now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So there's definitely some stuff going on. It wouldn't shock me to be a six. And then it, again, it wouldn't shock me to be a guy who really is never going to play like Philippe never plays, you know? Right. Exactly. An investment, a sign and trade investment, you know? Which All right, weird. so uh, uh, I know that you weren't able to go to training because you fell over drunk and hurt your ankle yeah, last week, yeah. um, tripped over the ottoman or whatever it was. Uh, but you did get to look at some video that the club released and, and ask Lucci some questions today. Any other notes from training that you'd like to throw out on the pod? Yeah, just generally speaking, Lucci said today that this year, there because of the new – COVID protocols are slightly more relaxed and because the team all got their shots or whatever, they now can integrate North Texas and the Academy much more into training and specifically in the video B-roll they put out for news stations to use today. That was from practice. There were two Academy players that I spotted in training. One of which is Knight Pickering, which I know you, you love that guy, Peter. Um, now cool again, hair, cool name. Yeah. The dude's a player. He's a pure goal poacher, a guy who's, some is more than his parts. He uh, <laughs> Now, he's the best nine in the academy. Like, if you start at the top and go down age brackets, he's the best nine you come across. So with Jesus Hurt, again, he's back in. But they wouldn't keep bringing him back in if he wasn't keeping up. So credit to him. He's definitely moved himself up the list of guys to watch. The other one is Grady Easton, who similarly is the best center back. If you start at the 19s and, keep, and go down, so you hit a great center back. Well, he's a U19. He's the one that played for North Texas last year. He came from Quill's old academy, came up here like for, for his senior year, basically. I'm expecting him to play for North Texas a whole lot this year. Uh, I think technically he's committed to SMU. So it'll be interesting to keep an eye on him because they definitely look like they're grooming him pretty aggressively too for him to be in first team training again this quickly. And he was in North Texas scrimmage the other day too again. So um, those are the only two guys. But the more important part is the fact that he, he was specifically talking about North Texas and the guys moving back and forth and how you can do that now again. And, and so you'll see more guys play for North Texas this time than last year. And that's really, really positive uh, for the club. Is Knight on the North Texas roster? The North Texas roster has not been released. He's not signed to a professional contract. Um, they eventually on USL one, they play this weekend. So at some point they have to register it's a big bunch of players. It's something like, I oh man, it might even be 40 players. They have to register as being mm -hmm. hypothetically available for the game day roster. And so that'll include like seven or eight Academy kids right out of the gate. And we'll find out. So Knight Grady almost certainly will be on there. I mean, it was last year. And so Knight probably will be, 
I, I, this, I've got a list of about 15 different Academy kids that could be in that mix. So we'll see. Uh, that's one of my favorite things, of course, is watching that stuff. So hopefully when, uh, though, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, hopefully they'll, they'll do that thing they uh, did before COVID where they, 48 hours before they released the six FC Dallas players and five Academy players that are, that are eligible to play in the game. Yeah, that, that's a thing that you had to do when you could actually move people back and forth, and that would be cool to see that come back. I don't think you'll see six of FC Dallas guys go down. Uh, Benny Redzik probably will be almost certainly, since he's not even technically on the Dallas roster. Um, you know, so he'll be one, and then maybe Munjoma, maybe who else, Dan? Maybe um, probably not Edwin. Uh, probably not. Uh, Nikosi will be with the first team. Yeah, because especially when you're playing back three, you have to take him. So. Um, on the upside, what? I did hear uh, today, and you asked me this earlier, Peter, I'm going to throw it in because I just heard no surgery for Jesus, so that's a real win on his shoulder. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. I uh, just got a text about that, so that's a good win. All right. Put a Band-Aid on it, Jesus. Get back on. out there, mister. Yeah, it means it'll be a shorter time frame and, and, and you know, just some rehabbing. And, uh, you know, he's already started the rehab process apparently, so that's, that's a real win. Um, you know, I, I think early in the year, Quill will take a couple of games figuring out what he has and doesn't have. And they've signed more players than I remember them doing in the past. So there may not be as many FC Dallas guys going down, particularly in this early part of the year, because they're light. FC Dallas is light in players. They've got four open roster spots. So, um, you know, the, but you'll see a lot more of interaction and training. And, and and for sure, some academy kids will come up. And, and Luchi even mentioned today some guys that are 05s and 06s might even be playing soon enough with the with – the, North Texas, and I got a whole list of those dudes that are legit good, like my buddy Matthew Corcoran. What uh, time and who are they playing? And is that is that it down in Arlington, the North it's, Texas game? It's in Arlington, and they playing uh, Fort Lauderdale, which means that you'll get to see a designated player playing for Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> <laughs> he's not going to play with them. I mean, he's on their roster, right? Pellegrini yep. or whatever his name is. Yeah, that's a fun bit. <laughs> And for those who don't know, that's the that's the end result of Miami cheating on the Blas Matuti signing, and so they had too many DPs, so they had to kick this dude. I can't imagine. He must be pissed. I can't imagine what the deal is with that guy. And so now he is for he now he's two of their a USL one. He's playing in yeah. the USL doesn't he player in USL one? Imagine how mad his agent is right now. Oh, yeah, what a clown show. Uh, Seven thirty in Arlington, Fort Lauderdale, uh, which Jason Christ is no longer the coach of, but um, that was his team. Jason's now a first team assistant with them, but I don't know who their coach is now. Uh, so something happened last week. Actually, two things happened last week that I thought were pretty funny. FC Dallas produced an article about numbers, and that really seemed like a, a real homage to you, Buzz, about numbers. I mean, I'm not going to take credit for it or anything, but I certainly felt like they wrote it for me. I, yeah, no, I, I didn't say that. No, that, <laughs> you didn't write it. I thought it was an yeah. homage. Like, we, hey, somebody was smart enough to go, hey, this is really Buzz, uh, Buzz's jam. Let's write this article about numbers. And then, because I've been doing this whole bit on Twitter for several weeks now, we're offering my services to Major League Soccer for free to become the official kit assigner for the league. At no cost to them. I'll do it every week. I'll, I'll create the graphics. I'll communicate it and engage with the fans and explain why we picked which kit did what, and blah, blah, blah. And then magically, uh, I think on Thursday, uh, on the new MLS site, they actually produced an article where they went through and did a, they went and reviewed and showed all the kits for all the games this week as they've been assigned. And I was, I was entranced by that. It was fantastic to see it because not only did they show the kits for both teams, they included the referee's kit in there too. So, uh, chef's kiss. Yeah, all to uh, Major League Soccer. Hopefully, they uh, continue to do it through the whole season, and they don't get tired of doing it and poop out and flake out. You know, in a few weeks. Well, I love the numbers thing because most people, even if you don't pick the numbers that I would like, they still usually have a reason and a story why they picked them. So I thought that was terrific color, really great stuff. I was so glad that someone who actually understands soccer wrote it and was able <laughs> to put, you know, and sometimes with people that don't understand soccer write stuff, you can tell. So. And then uh, really good too when some people that understand soccer know that people care about kits and put the, those kit things together too. I, I used the image on my dang game preview article. I thought it was so cool. Yeah, it was great. Uh, now the other thing that happened today, I got a, I got such a good giggle out of it. Uh, the American analyst uh, analysis guys, 
what is that what yeah. is that account yeah american analysis the, the guy that do xg there are guys that are really really uh you yeah. know popularizing and and coming up with all these new ways to uh, you know uh digitize soccer into a bunch of stats and they're great guys they posted a very funny tweet and i don't know if they're serious about selling this shirt <laughs> but it's a it's a picture of christian coleman in the infamous Christian Coleman completely bonks the easiest goal in the history of the world. Um, did you guys see this? I did. Yeah. yeah. Dan, have you seen it? Yeah. Yeah. And I thought it was funny because, as you know, uh, I have found a great source of humor of that moment. And I actually grabbed a video and turned it into an animated GIF years ago or whenever back it happened. And I saved it. And I, and I was serious when I retweeted it out. I wonder... If I could mint that GIF and turn it into an NFT and sell it on the on the dark web, oh no, those those died before the European Super League. <laughs> the <laughs> NFT thing is over and done with already. That's yeah. a fad that's come and gone. Solid three uh, weeks. Oh, people made have seen money with those things for three weeks, man. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, come on, Christian Coman bonking and hitting the hitting, <laughs> kicking the post instead of the ball. <laughs> With XG on top of it of <laughs> point nine or whatever, that was my favorite. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. I think they reported that as a as an XG score of zero point nine four, which yeah. is he's the reason that there's point zero six off that. <laughs> yeah, just his inclusion in that particular scenario is immediately a deduction of point zero six. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I did love that. Now uh, we also should get an update because there was so much. Uh, crazy uh, wailing and gnashing and teeth over the safe standing area prior to the game. Uh, I think there was a lot of legitimate concern from the from the fan base about the safety level of the temporary barriers that were put in place. Uh, Dan, can you report how it went down on game day? Uh, did was did did anybody suffer a major gash to the head or Achilles or did anything collapse? Um, apparently two of the rails did wobble a little bit and came loose. Um, you know, for the most part, they had some pretty good fixings in there and they, they were just fine. Okay. They have already replaced most of them with the, the permanent rails, which look like, uh, the ones in Orlando city. Uh, yeah, I saw that picture today. I thought, I thought that looked fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the bolts are still there, the exposed bolts, and they will stay there. Uh, they will just uh, supposedly be covered up with something, uh, presumably <laughs> like a rubber cap or whatever. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, you know, I know you, I know you went at the game, but the uh, supporters sounded fantastic. It, it made such a difference to to have people back in a in a wedge rather than. Uh, spread out over a long distance like the the width of the field in the in the beer garden okay i'm i'm so. glad to hear this and uh buzz and you can throw in your opinion on that too because i i i you know i've expressed my concern about removing those guys out of the beer garden and i did think at least on television there were two things that i noticed immediately one is that whole stage thing with that weird signage and the trucks looks really odd on television uh, it looks like something's under construction, frankly. And the fact that you never saw the supporters groups once during the game, there was one kind of pre-recorded shot in the open, um, but nothing during the game, although you could hear it. It made me wonder how it had translated, the move had translated uh, in real in, in real life and in, in, in person. Well, in the stadium, it sounds great. Um, you know, you can, that, that, I guess the South End Hall of Fame, whatever, kicks their noise back a little bit better than the stage did for some reason. Um, I thought it sounded fantastic. And, and multiple people commented that it sounded fantastic. Somebody said that the in our Discord chat today that the, the supporters had a call in with the team and they only had one person complain and asked to be moved. And that most all their feedback was that everybody around them actually loved it but and liked the atmosphere. And Lucci liked it so much, he actually t- directly tweeted at the supporters groups that how awesome he thought it was. So, um, you know, kudos to that all the way around. And the, the new rails finally getting in there look good. You know, there's going to be some cup holders added, which is obviously a win for people that like beer. You know, the, the thing on the other end, the north end, you're right, it does look a little bit like they're trying to just kind of fill up some empty dead space. I mean, that's what it is. 
you have to hope that over time that execution will get better. It, it yeah, looks a bit worse horrible. that they just use the old bleachers to to hang those signs up as well. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny to me because I, th- I I think there's a lesson to be learned out of all of the stuff that went down last week when the supporters group's leadership were so surprised uh, by, you know, the lack of progression in terms of, of finishing that out. And, and I... You know, a lot of the, the, you know, what we were told had gone down when, you know, the initial event was canceled because it wasn't ready to go. And then the leadership was invited on Thursday and they saw it and they were like, hey, you know, the the club was actively asking them not to talk about it publicly because it was going to turn into this awful story that would make the club look bad. And I thought that was the most ridiculous thing the club could have done, which was to try to squelch it. And instead of turning it into a positive, you know, if. I know this seems ridiculous, but if they had gone out and bought everybody bike helmets to wear in that first game, that would have been funny, and people would have been behind um, it and bought into it. A lot of people brought bike helmets. I know, but you see what I'm saying? Like, trying to figure out how you take lemons and turn it into lemonade, and this team seems to be, this club, the front office seems so bad at that. I mean... The usual you, thing is taking a, le- a cup of lemonade and just urinating in it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. But I was, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, uh, it, it, look, the club is at fault. I know they're going to try to blame the vendor, but that's not how projects work. You had plenty of time to get this finished. There was no reason for it to have, have, have been drug out this long. You could have figured out a better way to message this, to communicate it to the fan base, to the supporters groups. And it would have been a really smart idea to have shown everybody the progress over just this one week and how these new railings look fantastic and they're going to be painted and, and they're going to have cup holders and all that stuff. I, I and I hate to always poke on these things, but they seem to be the easiest things to re- to do correctly. And that's why I get so frustrated when they handle them in the manner that they did last week. Because I just think it turned into a big potential nuclear bomb for the club. And it really made them look stupid on the on the league level because it got the, all of those pictures and all of those narratives got retweeted from so many different people at the league level that, it, man, they could have handled it so much better. Yeah, that's something I've said about this team for a while is that they quite often have relatively decent ideas about things. Not always, but relatively decent ideas. And then they just don't ever follow through on it 100%. They follow through with it, but they go with a cheaper version or they go with a limited version or they don't get it done in time or they don't, you know, it's just typical, you know, that they could have done, as you say, once they realized it was a problem, number one, get it done so it's not a problem. But number two, once you realize it's a problem, have fun with it. You know, mm-hmm. make it a positive because you know that it's going to get out. That's how it happens all the time. It's like the idea that you're going to keep, you know, moves quiet or whatever. It's like that's ridiculous most of the time. It's, you know, it, I, I, listen, I bagged on them enough. I'll leave them alone. It's just, it's just once again a case of that poor execution. Because the thing they got in there now looks great. You know, just yeah. do that in the first place. You had six, we had a longer preseason than normal. You've had like six months to get it done and you didn't get it done. Well, yes. I, I, it's like you say, everything's kind of of their own creation. You know, they started tooting the horn about uh, safe standing, right? You look, you think of safe standing, you think of what LA Galaxy have, LAFC has, what DC United has, what Borussia Dortmund have, and Celtic, and all these other clubs that have like really exciting atmospheres. The the rails that have the fold out seats, and then they were like, "Yeah, bike racks, yeah." <laughs> which, well, I mean, I get that they, which is fine, the permanent. The permanent solution is fine. Um, it's, you know, it's not what I would consider safe standing. It's kind of what I would consider a hark back to the terraces. But own it. Just be like, hey, this is yes. what this is. This is division. This is what's going to happen. Not just. I mean, it's not even damage control. It's just uh, allowing. It's the it's the meme of the dog sitting in the room on when everything's on fire, saying this is fine. No, they but just I'm, accept I, I'm... it. But what I'm saying is, is that when you realize you have a problem, how do you turn it into something positive? And there were ways to do that. And instead, what we heard were these like panicked meetings where key front office, you know, higher ups are like openly begging supporter group members not to talk about it publicly or or publish photos because of fear of how it will look online. And I'm thinking 
come on guys you knew this was going to be a problem come up with a come up with a strategy to turn it into a positive make something funny or or you know make the give the supporters a reason to defend it and and they just didn't do any all of that and i, I you know i could prattle on all and the funny thing is if like you say if they just came out and said it and said hey this is a vendor we've used for over 10 years they've done this and this and this and this which all came out fantastic and they've just completely crap the bed on this one we're never going to use them again people will probably be like oh all right fair enough we've all had a, a, a contractor screw us over at some point or something like that yeah i mean yeah they had six months to, to do something about it but if you've used them for 10 years i could see why you'd give them a much longer leash but just be open it's yeah. it's always the fc Dallas way why are you hiding stuff well, hopefully uh, by the time the next home game happens, it'll all be finished and uh, the supporters groups will enjoy it. And I'm glad to hear that, at least in terms of atmosphere, it may have improved the situation. Um, uh, and that's uh, and that's a good thing. I still think they should take me up on my idea of when goals are scored, the cars should honk their horns and flash their lights. That's oh, just, that's that actually a really cool. good idea, yeah. I, I was really disappointed. I, I jumped on the pregame uh, radio show and made a joke about those Toyotas are going to get demolished by Brian Acosta's moonshots, and he didn't have a single one. Wow. Good for Brian. Uh, oh, that's the other thing I wanted to ask, is the oddity that happened when the, the starting lineup uh, happened, and there was this like mysterious name on the substitutions bench, and nobody had any idea who it was. And I guess it turns out that Nikosi Burgess has decided not to use his last name anymore, and he's using his middle name as his last name? Yeah, Tafari. Yeah, Tafari. Okay, which is, uh, it, when I Googled that, turned out to be some sort of really kick-ass dude from the ancient times or something, and that's cool. But And it's all tied to him believing that his last name has something to do with slave ownership. And was this something he decided at the very last second, or did the club not know he was going to do it, or... I'm confused as to how we got so far and we didn't know he, the dude was going to change his name. Uh, I don't know. I think I remember seeing him with a different name in, in the preseason. Sometimes there's a disconnect between um, the team operations and PR. Where like the, he probably told the trainer, the equipment guys, hey, I'm going with you know Tafari on my jersey this year. And they were like, great, knock it together, done, you know, like months ago. And nobody bothered to tell anybody in the PR office that, oh, by the way, until they actually turned in the game roster and put Tafari down and everyone was like, well, who the hell is Tafari? You know, so it's like, <laughs> just like we did. Yeah. You couldn't see that happening. It's like, it's not the equipment guy's job to go tell the PR people, but it's somebody's job. So somewhere there has to have been a breakdown of communication to tell from so when he decided that and told the equipment guys for yeah. them to tell pr that it was changing so because the websites are still all say burgess i mean i changed third degree but nobody else the mls didn't change anything yeah I, I there's probably a really cool story in there uh that could be told and shared uh based on why the guy would choose to do that especially uh in our current social climate i think that probably would uh it would win a lot of people's attention so yeah, he'll probably be behind a paywall soon. Maybe that's maybe that's coming you, you, this week. You talk about uh, you know, you talk about like not owning situations, and Nikosi is when you talk to him, probably the most dialed in, intelligent guy on the team. Like you know, socially and just just in general, very very bright and, and to the point. And uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, there was that whole thing of when he just happened to be at Stonebriar and someone started choking on, on something they're eating. So he did the Heimlich on them and, you know, saved their life and the team never really owned it. They just tried to get everyone else to tell the story and no one really was, and everyone was kind of like, yeah, that's not our story to tell. Why don't you tell it? Yeah. And then they did. Well, well, especially because, um, and I don't think this is unfair, and I'm not trying to uh, I'm not trying to be that guy. But you know, they hired Gina Miller to be that person because she really kind of drove the idea that they could be the owners of their own stories and write their own content. And you know, we've obviously as as, a, as an organization uh, struggled with trying to do stuff 
uh, and and write stuff about the team, but sometimes things get held back because the team wants to do it. So I, if they're if 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 that's the job of the media crew for FC Dallas, they should be doing those things. You're absolutely right, and they shouldn't be leaning on local media to do it because I that was kind of my impression. The whole point to them hiring her in the first place. You think there's any chance they're downplaying it because of the reaction to the Black Lives Matter last year? Uh, no, I, you know, frankly, I think what happened was, is the guy probably told them relatively late and it just never, you know, I look, they've, I think they're down on staff. I think all MLS teams are down on staff. I think people are doing multiple jobs and it just was one of those things that just nobody thought of to, to correct and fix and, and do anything with. I, maybe there's just that, that level of thinking isn't happening, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, me neither. Look, it's easy for me to sit here with all my time on my hands and pick on these all these tiny little things, uh, and I admit that. But I again, I if I was running, if I if I was in the role of uh, like that at FC Dallas, these are things that I think are clearly obvious um, issues that had easy solutions to them that just didn't get done for one reason or another. And again, it's the first game of the season; it's early in the season. Crap happens. We'll get several weeks into it, and nobody will ever think of any of this ever again. I think you make excellent points, and I'm not sure that you or I or Dan has the answer to why it doesn't happen. Yeah, I'm just prattling on now. Um, I think it's definitely, you know, sometimes people say, like, you know, do we criticize to criticize, or it's like a a well-meaning thing and offering suggestions. Um, I think someone mentioned it about supporters groups and media, and it was like, we've all had these conversations and you know, we, we want what everyone wants to, to see our local teams that we cover thrive and, and to give us, you know, good, interesting stories to write and great games to cover and everything else. It's not like criticism for the sake of it. Peterson wants an MLS cup. That's all. That's really all I want is an MLS cup. Not much to ask. (laughs) Just, Just one. One. Then you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Just win one MLS Cup, and then I'll leave you alone forever. I promise. Ooh. Prom, prom. Just realize something. With last mm. seasons, every team the Hunts have sold have gone on to win another MLS Cup. <laughs> <laughs> There's no hope. Oh, oh, man. They're never okay. selling the same. Guys, I think we've covered everything we were going to talk about today. Anything else on the table before I shut this shop up? Oh, other than how great Pappy Check is, I don't really have anything else. Yeah, thanks, Pappy Check. That stupid song in my head all the time after. Um, Patreon's pretty good, too. Yeah, Patreon.com yeah, don't, don't slash third degree. Don't forget. Yeah, you, did I see somewhere you hit 200 people? I did hit 200 people. I'm really excited about that. That was goal number two on the way mm-hmm. to of, of four. So that was the next big threshold. I'm really excited. So is, is that the threshold that Dan and I start getting checks? Uh, No. Oh, okay. No, I did. you told I me you didn't want any of it. I did. Oh, I yeah. did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want a check, I'll get you a check. But uh, maybe I want one now. I um, uh, okay. How about well, a pappy check? Would that work? Yeah. I just a pappy check would be fine with me. Yeah. All right. Don't forget, kids. Third degree. The podcast is brought to you by Soccer Ninety North Texas SC First Kick Sale kicks off yeah. now at thirty percent off all North Texas stuff through this Friday the 23rd and all other merchandise at Soccer90.com is 25% off if you use the special third degree listener promo code which mysteriously and uniquely and smartly is just simply third degree so don't forget to go do that stuff alright Dan thank you for your time and participation in today's podcast ditto and Buzz I mean it when I said I just do this for free I love and passion you don't need to write me a check. Well, thanks, dude. I appreciate you hosting. You keep it professional for us. Uh, boy, you have a really low bar, sir. I do. Uh, F- <laughs> <laughs> it's professional. That's my bar. And to you, FC Dallas Curious fan, thank you. We will speak to you next week, hopefully with three points in our pocket, on another edition of Third Degree of the Podcast. Peter and Dan were not paid for their participation. Third Degree, the Third Degree Net Podcast. Third degree, the third degree never gets. Third degree, the third degree never gets. Third degree, the third degree never gets.